What is up, everybody? It's R.C. Maxfield here for the Back to 12 podcast. No Lyle on this one. This is the substitute, well, for the postgame show that I missed yesterday after Texas Tech lost in Fort Worth to unranked TCU 69-66. The number nine Red Raiders lost for the seventh time this season and really kissed their chances of a two seed, in my opinion. Goodbye, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe and also Follow me on Twitter at RCMB323, but also follow us on Spotify. If you're listening over there as well, we appreciate y'all in terms of listening to us. And hey, if you want to see our faces, obviously on YouTube, that's the way to go. The Back to 12 podcast. Let's jump into my analysis, though, of this game, because I think there's a lot to unpack. I think that when you look at this game from a half by half basis, I think that the first half of basketball, for Texas Tech yesterday, where they scored 41 points, was one of their best offensive performances of the year in terms of what they've done offensively and really how aggressive they were on the boards as well as just trying to get to the rim. I thought that they were really, really aggressive as all three of their offensive rebounds came in the first half yesterday. Um, Yeah, and I mentioned it was a tale of two halves. I, I, I think that that is really just a way to undersell it honestly I think Texas Tech played their worst half of basketball offensively um, in the second half in Fort Worth they scored 25 points they refused to run really kind of any aggressive offense and when they did run an aggressive offense they passed too much or they were just far too aggressive in the sense that TCU had a couple bodies near the rim and they thought they could get there TCU draw drew a couple of charges and also just Texas Tech looked out of control Right. But for a majority of the second half, Texas Tech just looked like they had no reason to play offense. They refused to try and get in deep. The aggressiveness was all gone. They waited till the final 10 seconds on a majority of their offensive possessions and really didn't even get within the three point line until those final 10 seconds. It was frustrating and something that really was just the polar opposite of what happened in the first half. So it was kind of shocking. Now, obviously, the big takeaway for me in this game is the 20 turnovers. Texas Tech has turned the ball over on average the past three games 17.3 times. They're averaging now 13.8 turnovers per game. Something's got to change there. You're going to face better athletic teams in the tournament. And now I will say this. TCU has seen them twice. There was obviously something to change there. OU Porter Moser, one of the best coaches in the country in the Oklahoma game, first time seeing them shut Texas Tech down. There is a blueprint to beat the Red Raiders, and I think that there is teams out there, albeit probably 8 to 12, that have the athletes to do it. But any given night, Texas Tech has proven to be able to shoot themselves in the foot. They did it in Norman, and they did it in Fort Worth. And now they have no chance to win the Big 12 with just one week remaining. Now, the big news in this is that seven of the top 10 teams in the country lost yesterday. The highest ranked team to win yesterday was Duke at number seven. That's something that isn't getting talked about enough. So if Texas Tech was to lose, and they lost to an NCAA tournament team in TCU, they are an albeit lock now. Um, Wouldn't shock me at all if they're an eight or nine seed in the tournament. What they did yesterday, yes, hurt in terms of getting that two seed, winning the Big 12 um, in the regular season. But I think at worst, Texas Tech is going to be a three seed. Now, that assumes that they're going to win these two games. And yes, I I am worried about Oklahoma State because a team with nothing to play for, that is their Super Bowl, Oklahoma State. That is their Super Bowl because they can't make the tournament and they are not allowed to play in Kansas City. So I think that is a big game. I'm worried about Kansas State because I do think they're a good team as well, but it's at home. I do expect Texas Tech to handle business. Now, when you look at Ken Palm and what Texas Tech has done so far this season, they are eighth in the country. Ahead of them is Gonzaga, who lost yesterday. Kentucky lost yesterday. Baylor won. Arizona lost. Duke won. Kansas lost. Houston, I, that's one thing I don't get. I love Ken Palm, but I have no idea how the hell Houston is ahead of Texas Tech in this. I legitimately have no idea. They have one of the worst quad one wins records in the country. I have no idea how they're this high, but they are. They're playing right now at the time of this recording and currently beating their opponent down in H-Town. So they fall to eighth. The committee has already shown that they are going to look at net ranking as well. Let me pull up net ranking because 
that's something that is also super interesting in this ordeal because I am a big proponent of Kim Palm, but I want to see what the net rankings updated because if Texas Tech didn't fall that far because I don't know how they reacted to yesterday, right? So Texas Tech did fall. They were seventh, and now they are tenth. That's a big drop. The teams in front of them, Gonzaga, Arizona, Kentucky, Houston, Baylor, Kansas, Villanova, Tennessee, and Duke. Teams ahead of Texas Tech that they have beaten. They are 2-0 and against Baylor. They are 1-1 and against Kansas, and they beat Tennessee. They are 4-1 and against teams that are ranked higher than them. Excuse me, 4-2. and They did lose to Gonzaga as well. Four wins against teams ranked in the top nine net. No other team in the country can say that. So that's obviously big for Texas Tech. I will say this, though. I mentioned it from the jump of this podcast. I... I truly believe that Texas Tech has little to no chance unless they run the table in Kansas City and they beat Baylor and Kansas again um, to get a two seat. I I, I just don't see it with the teams above them now. I think that they are going to get that three seed, albeit it could be in Fort Worth. It will not be the two seed that everybody wanted um, in terms of being the two seed in Fort Worth in the South region, and that allows you to go to San Antonio and not leave the state of Texas potentially until you're in the final four, I think that's gone. I think that Texas Tech is probably going to be a three seed. Um, You know, some more slip-ups can change and everything like that. But me watching Texas Tech yesterday, you saw the flaws. You saw what Texas Tech can be. But it's really one of those deals where you saw the worst of Texas Tech, I think, in that second half, and arguably the best offensively that you saw Texas Tech. Uh, this year against a very good TCU team. And I'm not just saying that because TCU beat Texas Tech. I'm saying that because I think Jamie Dixon is doing a really good job. Um, You know, it's one of those deals where I don't think people recognize what TCU is because they're middle of the pack and there's four teams in the Big 12 that are just clear as day better, at least. Um, Their resume say that. Obviously, TCU beat Texas Tech. Um, One of those teams that I think is clear as day better, but everybody has one of those days or I guess one of those halves. Um, But the weird thing to me was, and this is why I think it was just a a blimp on the radar, honestly, um, when it comes down to it is it was a second half that Texas Tech struggled. If this would have been opposite, um, that would have not surprised me as much just because Texas Tech is a second half team, but they were, they are a second half team, as I mentioned, and they didn't do well in the second half, only scoring 25 points yesterday and Fort Worth. So I think when it comes down to it, it's a blip on the radar, but I will say this. I am concerned about the turnovers at this point. I love the aggressiveness of the offense. um, Really over the last really big 12 play, they've been really aggressive. Um, Something that you really haven't seen when coach Beard was the coach at Texas tech. The motion is now gone. Coach Beard Perry and and the offensive staff have done a really good job of allowing Texas Tech and the athletes that they have to be aggressive. Is the point guard factor in terms of the lack of having a true one in the starting lineup hurting? Yeah, I think probably to some degree. But I also think at the same time, with how Texas Tech rotates players in and out, they're literally playing with 10 right now, maybe even 11 with the way K.J. Allen has played once Daniel Bacho gets back. I think you have options to be the primary ball handler for short periods of time, whether that's Kevin, Kevin uh, McCuller, excuse me, whether that's Adonis Arns, Malik Wilson, Terrence Shannon, um, Clarence Nadalny. Um, you have guys that can be that guy, albeit you don't have a true one. Um, it is a little bit concerning, but I don't think it is the overall biggest concern for me. The biggest concern for me is the turnovers. It's simple and plain. It's that, and maybe your argument Um, in terms of what I'm saying with the turnovers would be, well, RC, they don't have a true point guard. That's why they turn the ball over so much. I don't think that's the case. I I think that really when it comes down to it, the reason Texas Tech turns the ball over so much is they're pass happy and they don't, they're trying to find the perfect shot. And that's the problem, right? These past few games, it's worked out for them, right? They're two and one. They blew out Oklahoma. They did have 17 turnovers in that game, but it didn't come back to bite them because their defense was so damn good. But they're pass happy on offense, which is great. Ball movement is a good thing until it's not. And ball movement for Texas Tech has been a problem in terms of their over committing to it. They need to take the open shots and not try and find that perfect shot. Take what 
the defense is giving you, whether that's the corner three, the simple mid-range. And I know the analytics people are out there saying, RC, never take a mid-range shot. It's all layup in threes and whatnot. Well, if you're open and you have a guy like Devion Warren in the mid-range, Bryson Williams in the mid-range, take that shot, man. I think that Texas Tech, with all the players that they have, it's a blessing and a curse, right? You have guys any given night that can go out there and be the leader scoring wise in this game for this team, excuse me. So you have Terrence Shannon, you have Kevin McCuller, O'Banner, Williams, Warren. I mean, you have so many guys, Adonis Arms, you have literally six, seven, maybe even eight guys that can go out there and lead you in scoring any given night. And that is an absolute blessing if you're the Red Raiders. But I also think it could be a curse in the sense that the guys are trying not to do too much. They're trying to keep everybody involved, keep everybody on their toes, which is good, but until it's not, as I mentioned. And I think that that's what happened yesterday was they dribbled too much against TCU. They passed too much and they weren't aggressive in the second half. And that's something that was um, interesting to see because it was a total 180 um, for Texas Tech in terms of the offensive mindset in the second half and credit to TCU. They did an unbelievable job yesterday and, I think you can say this as well. I know I am uh, kind of shitting on Texas Tech right now um, in terms of the ball movement and everything like that. But you took an NCAA tournament team to the final seconds when you arguably played your worst offensive half of basketball this season, at least in Big 12 play, because that was terrible. It's either that or against OU and Norman. You pick. I don't care. I'm OK with either. Um but I, I think it's just the turnovers at this point. That's the part that really is concerning to me. Do I think they correct it? Yes. How much? Probably gets back to their average in that 13 to 14 range, which is obviously huge. If you have seven less turnovers yesterday, you win the game um, easily. But I, I think when it comes down to it for me, I am super excited about this Texas Tech team. I don't think there's any way that you can't be excited about it. This was just a blimp on the radar. I think that Texas Tech is still a very, very good basketball team. I think they have the potential to play down in New Orleans. But I will say this. I think that now, realistically looking at this in the final week and seeing how many teams around the country are really, really good. I mean, the Tennessees of the world, the Arkansas of the world that are surging late. I legitimately could see, and I know this is going, this might be the highest number I've ever said for the final four. I can legitimately see like if you told me X team made it there out of this group of 16, I think that there are 16 teams that could make it to the final four. So there, that means there's probably 20 or 21. If we're really being honest about it, that could make the final four. And that's wild. That's awesome for college basketball. Obviously super excited that Texas tech is one of those teams, but also it's scary as hell because any given night you could lose in the round of 32 if you're not playing your best. And those turnovers could affect Texas Tech. But let me get to some of these questions um, real quick from Twitter that I had. Um, so we have this. We have uh, from Nathan. Even the announcers have called the refs terrible today. In the second half, we can't seem to pass or catch a pass well at all. We just look completely out of sorts this half. Needed this for a two seed after so many losses above us today. Yeah, it it would have been nice um, if Texas Tech won that. I, I'll say this. I think if Texas Tech wins that game, they probably are on the two line. Um, yeah, I, I, I think so because they have a chance at winning the Big 12 title at that point, um, which would have been absolutely huge. You're half a game back um, of Kansas at that point. Maybe KU doesn't lose another game. Who knows? But that would have been big. And if you – are half a game back at Kansas, I, I, I truly think you are a two seed. Um, yeah, I agree with you in the sense, Nathan, that the second half was one of those halves where you've had two of them in the past, what, six weeks, I guess, since the Oklahoma game. Other than that, I mean, you played really, really solid basketball and even elite basketball in half. So again, I think it is a blip on the radar. Get them out of the way right now. Um, obviously, at least that's the hope, but I think Texas Tech is too good for that to be an indication of what this team really is about. Um, this from Jacob H917. I understand the play call at the end, but what happened to our baseline cuts that worked so well last game? We look like we didn't take this team seriously and it cost us. O'Banner back on the cold streak and we are leaning on Williams to bail us out too much. Sloppy. Yeah, I I wholeheartedly agree with you on the baseline cuts. That's something that 
I think Texas Tech is really, really good at, especially Devion Warren, um, Terrence Shannon. And it's something that I don't think they use enough, um, especially in moments where they're struggling offensively. Now, they you, obviously, when it's working, the offense looks absolutely amazing, and they used it in the first half. But in the second half, give credit to TCU a little bit for cutting off those. But also at the same time, Texas Tech is good enough where TCU – and let me rephrase this. Texas Tech is good enough, and they have enough options where TCU is not going to stop all of them. TCU is just not good enough to do that. And that's no disrespect to TCU. I think they are a great team. Um, I think that they have a chance to surprise some people potentially because they have a big that I really like, and they also have one of the best guards in the country. That being said, I think when you look at what Texas Tech brings to the table, I have no idea where the baseline cuts went yesterday. They were completely stagnant in the second half. Like I said earlier, I, they almost went back to the Mac McClung offense last year where it was, okay, Mac, make something happen in the final 10 seconds. We don't really care what the shot looks like. Just hopefully get something to the rim. I mean, they struggled, and, and it was bad, and you're right on Kevin O'Banner. I have been probably his – Biggest supporter in terms of, hey, it'll come around, it'll come around. And I still think it will. I think he's going to help. I think he's a big game player. Um, but also at the same time, I get the frustration from fans. I really do because I've talked about it in the past where Texas Tech is super inconsistent with shooting. They're either great or they're awful. There's really no in between. And um, Kevin O'Banner is the poster child for that, I think. And, I mean, prime example, Texas game where he just could miss – and then he goes on the next game and he goes, I think, 0 for 4, 0 for 5 from 3. So, um, yeah, man, it's it, it's rough. It, it's rough in that regard. I, I just think he's far too talented. He's got too many numbers that say um, he's too good for what he's currently shooting. But it's getting to that point of the season where maybe it's just a bad shooting season for Kevin O'Banner. Maybe we just need to have that conversation. Um, appreciate you commenting as well as uh, Nathan commenting. Had some more on here. This from Jordan. Um, he says, regardless of how the refs were, how our defensive scheme didn't execute today, I'm not sure how much more evidence is needed that Terrence takes atrocious shots when we need a shot to win. He seems like he is fighting for his NBA shot more than the best play Tech needs to win. No hate against Shannon. He has the skills to make it past the D1 level, but mental mistakes of his had the late game direct impacts on more than one occasion. People make mistakes, but doing the same thing repeatedly, expecting a different outcome is the definition of insanity. So, Nathan, I'll say this, um, and I'm not saying you're the one, uh, only one doing this. Um, me personally, I don't get the hate for Terrence Shannon Jr. Um, in late game situations. Reason being, that's what the play call is. Terrence Shannon is your guy. Um Mark Adams is going to say that in that situation. Um, and sure, could the shots be better? Yeah, but also at the same time, maybe they could have gone, been drawn up better. Maybe the defense just took away what they wanted. Maybe they need to just do something with the pick and roll, right? I, I think when it comes down to it, there's no arguing Terrence Shannon has taken some bad shots in the past, in the last minute or two. But I also ask, who else are you going to want to take that shot that can create themselves because Bryson Williams can create a, to himself for himself in some degree, but not to the degree of Terrence Shannon. Um, you want Debbie on Warren taking that. Okay. Adonis arms. Okay. I think when you look at it though, Terrence Shannon jr. Has earned that. And now again, do not hear what I'm not saying. He has struggled in that regard, but also I'll say this. I've seen a lot of fans say this team is better without Terrence Shannon off the floor. In my opinion, that's bullshit. That's just bullshit, okay? And I will say the reason why is because with, with Terrence Shannon on the floor, your offense has the highest possible ceiling. Has your offense struggled at time with Terrence Shannon? Absolutely. But Terrence Shannon takes your offense to a level that nobody else on this roster can take it to when he is on. Simple and plain. And does he need to be more consistent? Yeah. I mean, I think you can say that about virtually everybody on this damn roster outside of Bryson Williams, who is just as a consist or as consistent as it gets. I mean, he's one of the most consistent players in America. So to just throw all this shade on Terrence Shannon Jr., I don't think is fair. Does he need to be better and more consistent? Yes. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Could he take better shots at the you know final couple of minutes of the game? Yes. Absolutely. I also think plays could be drawn up better. I also want to give credit to the defense for taking away really solid options, right? So 
I don't know. I, I think that Terrence Shannon Jr., the hate for him is just – it's kind of crazy in my opinion. Um, he's your best player, second best player if you want to throw Bryson Williams in there, which I think is more than fair. Um, and with Terrence Shannon Jr. on the floor, he takes your offense to heights that nobody else on this team can take it to. Him and Bryson Williams is a pick-and-roll nightmare, which I wish they would use more often, by the way. Um, which they are starting to use more often when the offense looks good and they just totally went away from pick and roll um, in the second half yesterday, it felt like. Um, but those two are a dynamic duo. And if you take Terrence Shannon Jr. off the floor, and again, I'm not trying to disrespect anybody on this team, but say you put him on the bench and you put Debbie on Warren in his place, the ceiling for this offense does go down, like it or not. Um, Terrence Shannon is a very good basketball player. I get it. He's probably pressing a little bit too much. Um, some of the things he does are quite, it's, it's questionable. I get that. But I also think you can say the same exact thing for virtually everybody on this roster. And then some, um, Terrence Shannon Jr. has elevated his game to new heights here at Texas tech. And the problem, I think that, um, really the Terrence Shannon Jr. Hate goes too far is there's not enough love for him when he does well, people only target him when the team is doing bad, which I guess is a sign of a star player, right? That's part of it. What is that in football? Like you never really talk about the offensive line until it's bad. And you only give the quarterback, you, know, you really only talk about those star quarterbacks when they make an amazing play or they're bad. I mean, I get it. Um, it is what it is. Terrence um, hasn't probably lived up to his expectations this season, but also without Terrence Shannon jr. I think your ceiling in March goes down significantly. Um, and that's just my honest opinion. I wasn't trying to take it out on you, Jordan, there, but um, that's just my honest and true opinion. Let me give a uh, at shout outs here, by the way. That was from Jordan. He's at Jordan TTU 30. Um, let me go up here. Jacob um, H917 is at H917, Jacob. And then uh, Nathan Edwards, the question I answered is at N A E or N A Edwards. 15, 12. I appreciate you guys sending in the questions. And then I had one in my messages or actually had multiple in my messages. Let me go make sure. Um, this from Montana, Montana at underscore 2210. Is Santos Silva a top four important player to this year's team? Yeah, man, I think so. I think Marcus Santos Silva is one of those players that doesn't get enough credit for what he does for this Texas Tech men's basketball team. Um, he's really, really good. Um, he can guard one through five. He makes really good decisions offensively in terms of passing for a big man. Um, also has gotten a lot better um, in terms of the aggressiveness down in the post and actually shooting the ball. Um, so that's big. Uh, but yeah, I think Marcus Santos Silva is one of those players where um, his, his talents and contributions cannot go unnoticed anymore um, in terms of not being one of the most important players on the team. Um, this from Flash Gordon, QB3. At QB3, QB3, um, he says, hope it's not too late for the podcast, but I just wanted to say, while this loss sucks, I think we need to not hit the panic button. It sucks that we missed our opportunity with other top teams losing, but whether or not we get a two seed or a three seed doesn't matter. The best teams in college basketball know that at some point they're going to have to match up against the top dogs. So whatever seed we get doesn't matter in the long run. Yeah, I think that's probably the a good way to look at it, but – I also think at the same time, it would have been very beneficial for Texas Tech to win yesterday. Obviously, any win is beneficial, but even more so with how many teams lost in front of them and the fact that they still had a very good chance at getting that two seed um, in the South, because it would not shock me at all at this point now if Baylor's a one seed. Um, I, I could see that happening. I think so. Baylor would go off of that two seed line that you were on. And you, if you win yesterday, I think you take over that two seed spot in the South. Um, but obviously you didn't beat TCU. You didn't handle business. I think when it's all said and done, Texas tech is going to be a three seed. Um, I, I think that that's, what's going to happen. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. They're still one of the best teams in the country and still one of those teams that I don't think it should shock anybody if they end up down in new Orleans for the final four. So Again, Texas Tech, they lost to TCU upcoming this week in terms of what their schedule looks like. They have K-State for senior night on Monday at 8 p.m. I will be doing a post-game show live on uh, 
Twitter spaces, excuse me. And if I had to guess, um, the AP poll comes out tomorrow, I would probably guess Texas Tech drops maybe one spot to number 10, maybe number 11. Um, I don't think they drop too much at all. And then they finish their season at Oklahoma State next Saturday in Stillwater. That's a scary game, especially when uh, Oklahoma State has nothing, and I mean nothing to play for, um, as they cannot go play in Kansas City in the Big 12 tournament, and they cannot play in the NCAA tournament due to their one-year postseason ban. But, hey, I appreciate everybody hopping on here. If you haven't already, please subscribe. We're trying to get to 200. Might even have a special guest on once we get to 200. We need y'all to get there. Help us out. Follow me on Twitter at RCMB323. And if you haven't already, be sure to follow, rate, and subscribe over on Spotify. Really appreciate it. I think we just passed the 1,000 download mark uh, for the podcast, which is unbelievable considering we've only put out about six of them. So we really appreciate everybody. This is a slow moving machine, but we're starting to get there. We're about to be at 800 views for the f- first time at our previous podcast, but now we really want to, we're ramping this up. Lyle and I are going in. We're going to have some special guests talking about the NFL draft, the NFL combine and much, much more might even have some people, uh, and some former players at Texas Tech that you might recognize here on the podcast in not too long. But again, Texas Tech loses 69-66 to TCU and Fort Worth. Again, I think this secures themselves if they finish business and go 2-0 this next week as a three seed, no matter what happens in Kansas City. But if, if, biggest if of the season for Texas Tech, if they win two or three games and maybe even the Big 12 title in Kansas City, You could be looking at that two seed in Fort Worth. I don't think all hope is lost, but it is on razor thin margins at this point. Again, I am RC Maxwell. I appreciate everybody listening and tuning in. Hey, we'll be back on. Well, I'll be back on Monday night over on Twitter spaces talking about K-State. If you have any questions at all, DM me over on Twitter at RCMB323 on my quest to get 5,000 subscribers. Appreciate everybody tuning in. We'll catch y'all next time. Stay safe. And as always, wreck them.